you. So hi, my name is Ridwana. I work at Internet Solutions, which is actually right here at the campus, so it wasn't a very far walk. Um, so today I'd like to take you on a journey, a journey to share my experiences with you, to share my experiences of a newbie developer as well as a female developer. So before we begin, I'd like to give you a bit of background on myself. So I have a degree in computer science and applied mathematics from the University of Witwatersrand. I am a part of the development world for approximately two years. And I say the word world because to me, development is a realm of its own. It's a wonderful and intriguing place full of the unknown and the mystery. And yes, sometimes what we call magic. So a lot of people ask me, why am I within the software development field? I am within the software development field because what better way to spend my days doing what I love and loving what I do? To me, software development is not just a day job. It's not just an employment contract, and it's not just a career. To me, software development is a passion, a passion to create something out of nothing, a passion that fills me with a sense of accomplishment on a daily basis. So, where do I start? Like every story, I'm going to start at the beginning. What is a newbie? A newbie, according to Wikipedia, is an inexperienced person within a profession. And yes, that was my first year and more. So, out of curiosity, how many of you guys are programming for more than five years within this crowd? Wow. And how many of you, out of those that are programming for more than five years, actually remember your first year really clearly? Wow. <laughs> So as you can see, I mean, as the years pass by, everybody forgets what their first year was like. They forget the hurdles, they forget the bumps, they forget what excited them, etc. And that's why I'm standing here today, to share my hurdles, my bumps, my excitements with all of you. So how did I feel as a newbie developer? The best analogy for me is that I felt like Alice in Wonderland. What an odd comparison, you might say. How does that even relate to software development? But to me, it's most appropriate. Alice in Wonderland is one of my favorite childhood stories. So Alice goes on an unexpected journey full of intrigue and interest. Yet at the same time, it was completely unnerving. And the same can be said for a newbie developer within the software development industry. So I'd like to bring a few key points from Alice in Wonderland and relate it back to my story. So the first one is growth. I think that that, that is definitely one of the key metaphors within Alice in Wonderland. When Alice eats, she grows. When Alice drinks, she shrinks. Growing up is like taking a ride on a roller coaster, the roller coaster that we call life. We experience so many emotions. Sometimes we're happy, sometimes we're sad, sometimes we're full of confidence, while other times we have extreme insecurities. I remember reading a funny saying the other day, and it went something like this. A new, devel a new developer thinks he knows absolutely everything. A mid-level developer thinks that he knows absolutely nothing. And an experienced developer, well, an experienced developer just hates computers altogether. <laughs> so we walk out of university thinking that we are on top of the world, that we know everything, everything from writing good code to designing and building applications. What we fail to realize is that university was simply a drop in the ocean. I mean, at university, I wrote maybe, say, 20 lines of code within an entire program, I wrote isolated code that needed to integrate with nothing at all, if there was anything at all, if, if there was any other program at all. And when I entered the working environment, I now needed to write systems that needed to integrate with numerous other systems. It was no longer 20 lines of code. Instead, I was writing modules, I was writing functions. They all needed to be separated, yet they still needed to talk to each other. And so, 
bang, that's how my on top of the world feeling came crashing down all around me. I mean, university is extremely valuable. It provides us with the skills and the talents as well as the problem solving abilities that we require in our daily working lives. However, university is also, also the university is the foundation of our education. And it's up to us to build upon that foundation. So I remember thinking to myself, how, how will I learn so many new technologies within such a short span of time while still meeting my deadlines? So I remember that, so university teaches us the theory behind the application, but what about actually putting that application into practice? So um, I think it's appropriate for me to maybe at this point give you some um, insight onto what I learned within my first year in this polyglot environment. And so I'm just going to start maybe at the basics and go through a few technologies that I needed to know and a few of the things that now I use with such ease, but at that time it was completely new to me. So the first thing is the famous and fearless Kit. Kit who has saved my life who has saved my life on numerous occasions and will continue to do so in the future. I mean, as a newbie, I'm, I was constantly pressing the wrong button in the terminal. I didn't know how to vomit up. And so kids would, I would just delete all the code that I had spent maybe three hours doing. And yes, it was Git that saved me at, at those times. And then there's other things like um, when you start building an application, you have the client side, you have the uh, server side. How do the, these two work? How do these two work together? What, how do they integrate together? And where's the border between the two? There's also things like APIs. How do we pull data from them? What's the difference between a RESTful API? What's the difference between a SOAP API? What kind of data do we get back from them? And then. Finally, there's the front end. Some people might call it the sparkly things. But no, it's not only sparkly. It takes a lot of hard work and dedication to get a front end up and running. The front end is what the user sees. The front end is what gives the user insight into your application. So it needs to be absolutely picture perfect. And so my first year was all this continuous learning and this continuous growth of trying to update my skills. No, not even updating my skills, just acquiring them for the very first time. However, just as Alice learns to use the resources in her world to control her growth, so can we. We can use those resources and make ourselves better on a daily basis. I remember that this might be the silliest thing to some of you, but I remember learning the power of Google, something that I didn't know before. I would come into a basic problem and finally I would Google it after. It wouldn't be the first intuitive thing that I would do, but I realized that Google can help you solve your problems. No, it's not gonna give you the answer. It's definitely not gonna always be right, but you can get some guidance and some direction from looking into what other people are experiencing and just taking something from it. There are other things like documentation, tutorials, interactive learning, and most of all, there are experienced people out there, people that can pass their knowledge onto us. So, this is a conversation between Alice and the cat in Alice in Wonderland. Would you tell me please which way I ought to go from here, said Alice. That depends a good deal on where you want to go, said the cat. I don't much care where, said Alice. Then it doesn't much matter which way you go, said the cat. So long as I get somewhere, Alice added as an explanation. Oh, you're sure to do that, said the cat, if you only walk long enough. And so, as the cat says, if you don't know where you want to go, you could just, about going, go, you could just end up going about anywhere. Figure out what your path is and get on it. At the rapid rate that uh, new technologies are being released, it is extremely difficult to keep focus on what's important. There are so many things to learn and yet so little time. I mean, when I entered the system integrators team, it's the team that I'm currently working in, 
they were using so many new technologies. They were using, they were building a, a really huge system on quoting. And um, so they were using stuff like, so for the front end, for example, we were using Haml and CS, which you have to have some background on HTML and CSS to understand. And the, we were using JavaScript, which actually we were writing CoffeeScript and it was getting compiled into JavaScript. And then on the front, on the client side, it was Marionette and Backbone. On the back end, it was Ruby on Rails. And yes, what we call the back end of the back end, that was Python. So there were so many things to learn. I didn't know where things fit. What did I need to learn first? What could I learn afterwards? So I was overwhelmed and I was exhausted. And I remember complaining to a fellow colleague and telling him, there are so many things to do, there's so little time, and I just don't know where to start. I mean, that was my main problem, just not knowing where to start. And Gabriel, actually, his wise, wise words of wisdom's wisdom was, start at the very beginning. First, master the technologies that you use on an everyday basis until they become effortless, and then move on to greener pastures. And I truly value this advice because it has given me some perspective on where I want to go and what do I want to do first. Stop doing things that get you nowhere. It take, the red green in Alice in Wonderland says, it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. So listen to the queen. I mean, the queen is always right, guys. So sometimes, no it always, it seems easier to keep doing what we're doing just because it's comfortable. But that doesn't mean that it's always right. Just because a new tool will have the initial learning curve, it doesn't mean that you should stick to your current one just because it's comfortable or just because you feel that you don't want to overcome that learning curve. This can be applied to numerous aspects of our job. For instance, it can be applied to things like the simplest things. Your IDE or your editor, which by the way is a really explosion prone topic. But um, yeah, it can be applied to things like that. I mean, use the editor that you feel most productive in. Use the editor that is most appropriate for your job, for the language that you're using as well. And then there's things like frameworks. Use frameworks that scale well with the current application you are using. Don't use the same framework over all applications because they might not be the best fit for all applications, but just for one particular application. Things like programming languages. Base it on application and domain of the program and not actually on what you just prefer. So the most valuable advice that I can give you is that weigh your options. Calculate the amount of energy and time that you will save in the long run, and then move over to something that's better for the job. Never settle for less just because of comfort or fear. So this conversation is between Alice and the Queen, and Alice says, there's no use in trying, Alice said. One can't believe in impossible things. I dare say you haven't had much practice, said the queen. When I was your age, I always did it for half an hour a day. Why sometimes I believed as many as six impossible things before breakfast. <laughs> so lastly and most importantly, this is relevant to new as well as very experienced developers. Sometimes we are so certain that something is impossible that we don't even attempt it. Rather than just thinking about something, start doing it. Rather than just thinking about contributing to an open source project that you've been wanting to do for, for years, do it. Break it down into smaller goals and start achieving those goals. You might say to yourself, but you know, I just don't have the time to contribute to open source. But you can make the time. You can break that into smaller goals that you contribute to on each day. Break it up into smaller chunks of time and by the end of the month, you'll have your full contribution to that open source project. The first step is always believing that nothing is impossible. Push your imagination to the limit and keep your creativity always up. A good attitude and some positive energy can get you a very long way. 
So on the next part of my topic, what's it like to be a female developer? So just as Alice experienced some out of the world phenomena, so do female developers all around the world. I remember leaving, what was very astonishing is that I left school and there were so many girls within my class that loved maths and loved science. And then I went to university and suddenly the number of females within my class was such a dreary number. So before I get any further, I'd like to do a slight experiment with you guys. So can all the male developers in the room please stand up? Okay, and now you can look around you. And you can sit down. And once you, once you all are comfortable, can the female developers please stand up? And look around you. <laughs> So yes, as you can see, the numbers are not balanced at all. These women within the IT industry are definitely a minority. And that's where I'm standing here in front of you today. I would like to maybe analyze why is this? What is the root cause of this? I'd like to share my experiences and maybe explain to you what it is like for a female within this development industry. So before we carry on, there's this video that I came across and it's really inspirational and I thought I'd share it with you. And so I know at the end there's a Verizon advert, but I promise I'm not advertising for Verizon. <laughs> huge impact. Isn't it time we told her she's pretty brilliant too? Encourage her love of science and technology and inspire her to change the world. Our, wor our words can have a huge impact. Isn't it time we told her that she is pretty brilliant too? Encourage her love of science and technology and inspire her to change the world. These words deeply resonate within my heart. Children easily trust our words. They trust us to make the right decisions for us. They're not at that stage to make decisions for themselves. Hence, if you see that your child is interested in science or mathematics, instead of blowing off that flame, ignite that spark. This video shows that parents and society and Basically, anybody in contact with the child can impact their decisions heavily. So I'm not standing here in front of you to give you parental advice today. I definitely can't. But instead, I'd like to just analyze the video and understand what is the reason that children choose not to go into mathematics and science. Based on research, it shows that there is an increasingly number of drop-offs between childhood and adulthood of females within the science and mathematics and engineering fields. Could it be that we are not encouraging our children enough to pursue science, technology, engineering, and mathematics? Could it be that society is not yet at ease with the notion of a female developer or a female engineer or scientist or anything for that matter? I am proud to say that I was encouraged by my parents to pursue my love for mathematics and science. I know they are still, as backward as this sounds, there are still parents out there who feel that my child should enter a career that is fit for a female, that is fit for her lifestyle that she would be leading. And it is the open-minded and the ones that, that choose to take these words to heed 
that are able to then change their behavior and open up their minds in order to be at ease with the notion of a female scientist or engineer, etc. Support, encouragement, and motivation is the key foundation for any young girl that wants to enter the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics fields. It takes a huge leap of faith and a huge boost in confidence. As a child progresses, progresses from childhood to adolescence, society, parents, family, friends, colleagues, all of them impact her decisions. Entering this industry in a minority comes with a lot of comes with, with a lot of negative emotions. It comes with initial feelings of constantly needing to prove oneself and one's capability. So before we carry on, I'd just like to mention, so when I entered the system integrated team in 2010, I was the first female developer within that team. And there, it puts one at an immediate disadvantage because I felt these exact emotions well up in me the constant need to prove myself and my capabilities. Whenever I wrote a piece of code, instead of just checking it once or twice, which is normal, I would go above and beyond, and I would keep checking it just to make sure that that phrase that girls can't code doesn't get thrown at me. I needed to prove that I was a girl and I could be a developer. It was frustrating and it was very tiring. It was frustrating that every time a male would talk to me initially, I would think, is he really taking my advice? Is he really understanding where I'm coming from? Or is he just thinking that I'm some girl within the development industry that just doesn't know what I'm talking about? However, I was quickly fortunate enough to realize that I was not in an environment that girls normally typically refer to, that that developers normally, that female developers consider a typical environment. I was treated in a respectful and a dignified manner. That changed my initial uncertainty to one of positiveness, something that provided fruitful outcomes. I felt at ease with my team and my, way, my opinions, my ideas, and my decisions were given the weight that, it was, that was required and that was dissolved. So I have a quote up there, first impressions last a lifetime. And to me, this quote is really important because an initial situation of ease and comfort will, stage, will, will provide a stage and will provide, will provide a manner about which a woman feels about, a manner that a woman feels for the rest of her career. So if she has an, an initial situation of unease and discomfort, it's going to set the stage for the rest of her life, for the rest of her working environment. I go to dev meetups, I go to conferences, discussions, and I never have that thought in my head whereby I'm expecting the worst. I always expect people to, I always expect people to value and take my opinion into account just because I had that initial initial treatment of respect and value. So this is a tweet that I read. A woman bragging that she's in IT is like a man bragging that he's a nurse. And think about that for a second. There are always the stereotypes and these preconceptions that society have, whether it's right, whether it's wrong, whether something is a norm, whether something is not a norm whether we're allowed to do something as a female or as a male, or whether we're not allowed to do it. And once we actually think about this, and once we actually understand this, we can begin changing the way that the norm, the norm was. We can now create our new norm. We can now make a change. So, I spoke about my journey from school to university, but now I'd like to transition from university to the working environment. And so I entered on my first day of work and a gust of, I opened the door and a gust of wind blew against my face. The smell of male musk hung in the air. 
unshaven beards, shabby clothes, blood red eyes stared back at me. No way, I'm just joking. I opened the door and there was a sea of men within the IT office. And yes, I was the first female there and it was extremely concerning. I literally felt at that point like Alice in Wonderland. Cool, so I've mentioned thus far, I've used terms like engineering, etc. But who actually knows what does STEM stand for? Yes, yeah, so STEM is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And these are the fields that we have a lack of women within. This is the shared reality of STEM. So in the next few slides, I'm going to take a step at understanding um, the situation around STEM and um, reasons for the intense lack of women in IT. What can, we better do, what can we do better to appeal to women within the IT environment? Can society contribute to this by being at ease with the notion of a female within the male-dominated environment? So I described all my positive experiences, and now I'd like to bring to your attention that the sailing is not always so smooth. So in the following slide, slides, I'd like to outline key areas whereby females have discomfort within the IT industry. So there are situations whereby a female developer will enter a room, and normally, as you guys seen, it's populated with male developers. And she'd enter the room, and it will be almost as if she does not exist. And that's one of the realities. In all fairness, though, it's probably the lack of education and experience around an exposure with dealing with women in IT how to communicate with them, and how to interact with them on a daily basis. And how would a female then deal with this situation? Or what, how would a woman deal with this situation? And so the easiest way is to just break the ice, Sora. Particip participate in conversations. Make it known that you guys have common interests. Because yes, I mean, you guys are both in the development industry. So there has to be some common interests. Women and men within the IT industry can communicate irrespective of gender. So there are other instances that I'd like to bring to your attention. And uh, these are some hurdles and boundaries that I've read about all over blogs, discussions, etc. And so I'm just going to bring them up next. So on their own, men can be respectful and acceptable, they behave in acceptable manners. However, it is explained that when there is a, a really loud and dominant man in the room, it then brings on the domino effect, which is known as the back mentality. This causes groups of men to behave in a disrespectful and sometimes unacceptable manner. For some women who code, out of office work, and conferences are hotspots for prejudice and harassment. Some women have complained that they are, they are treated as sex objects as well as properties to show off. I remember reading an article over the internet whereby this woman described that she was the only female within this conference, the only, the only woman there. And there were men that were constantly flabbergasted at why she was there. What was she doing there? Why was she even the only female there? Did she really belong there? Girls can't code. That is such a phrase, that is a phrase that gets thrown around so often. But you know what? Coding is not gender specific. Coding is based on intellectuality and not on gender. I have met and been inspired by numerous females within this industry that have showed me that, coders are, that female coders are esteemed, as well as they not only develop, but they teach others to code. For instance, there's Reshma Saujani, who started Black Girls Code. There's um, Rebecca Parsons, who is the CTO of ThoughtWorks. And then there's Leah Farrow, who is an esteemed web, web front-end developer. 
And so these phrases, which get thrown around in jest, they actually hurt someone out there, and they actually can demoralize someone. Last but not least, the famous programmer jokes, which have caused quite a stir in recent years. These jokes are just harmless fun, apparently, but they cause a huge impact in undermining a female's confidence. At times, sexist humor can be demoralizing, even if it is unintended. I came across this quote um, by Dr. Thomas Ford. Sexist humor doesn't create sexism where it doesn't exist, but allows for the release of sexism where it does. So keep in mind that for every female that speaks out against the discomfort in her working environment, there are another 10 that just wouldn't dare. There is a notion that telling the story aggravates the situation. And so I read an article in which I quote, no female wants to be known as the woman who cried sexism for fear of being labeled as a tattletale, a liability, or at the very least, just not worth the trouble. And so women are quiet about these issues because they do not want to be seen negatively in the public eye. They do not want their future jobs to be impacted and they do not want employees to not hire them just because they are seen negatively in the public eye, even though they actually are standing up for their rights. So I've highlighted all these scenarios whereby the workplace is uncomfortable but what can we do about it? It's no use just giving out problems but not actually providing solutions. And so, to me, the only requirement of being a female within a male-dominated environment is respect. Respect is the only requirement. Don't ignore a female or pretend like she doesn't exist. She might actually have some intellectual and thought-provoking thoughts that, could, that you could use or you could interact with her and it might be the start of a really long-lasting friendship. Never sway with the pack mentality. We've all been there, we've all been a minority in some sort of the other. Maybe it was cultural, maybe it was religion, maybe it was our interests. It could have been anything and we all know what it feels like. But before swaying with the pack mentality, think about what would you like your experience to have been had you been the minority? And leave that person with the same experience that you would want to be left with. We should not exclude people. I have seen the development community and we are an exclusive development community. When I joined as a newbie, I was included within all the meetups, within all the conferences. And so we are all about diversity. We should embrace diversity because after all, that is what South Africa is all about. A person is unique irrespective of gender and we should give that person the respect that they deserve. And so there's no hard and fast rule that I can give you. There's no formula that I can magically whop up and give to you to say, you know what, this is the formula that you treat females within the, within the software development industry with. But all I can tell you is that treat them with respect. I mean, about the crude jokes, not all women have the same feelings towards them. Some are okay with them, some will laugh a bit as well. And there are some that just don't want to be, don't want to hear the crude jokes within their company. And so I think the best way is to start off as politically correct as possible. And as you build a relationship with some, like every relationship, it's not only male and female with regard to male and female within the industry. For any relationship, start off as politically correct as possible and then as you build the relationship, that's when you get more comfortable with, with each other and basically draw the boundaries. And so there was this funny story in, um, when I started at the team that I'm working in. And so when I entered the, on my first day and my first week and first month, all the, so it was, I think, a team of like 13 males, and they were so politically correct. They would never crack a single joke that was like just out of order. It was astonishing. And a year later, I came to realize that actually they had had a discussion around a boardroom, uh, around a boardroom desk, and they said, you know what, guys? No crude jokes from today. It should just be... No crude jokes, that was it. 
And you know what? Some might actually say that's going to the extreme, that why should we alter our lives in a team just because a woman is entering the team? But you know what? In the long run, it's extremely beneficial. I mean, we started off our relationship as politically correct as possible, and then we've built our relationship, and now we understand each other, and we're able to create those boundaries and just be able to interact and have a good relationship. So, in conclusion, as a newbie developer, a newbie developer faces numerous challenges on his own, as I've mentioned. I've mentioned just a few that I, as a new developer, no wait, that I, as Alice in Wonderland, have experienced. The first year is always just difficult, but keep in mind that nothing is impossible and everything is attainable with the correct mindset, a positive attitude, and some positive energy. Sexism is a reality. It should not be promoted and neither should it be encouraged. Not all women in the industry are as fortunate as I am to have experienced an environment whereby it was motivational and it promoted my growth. Some women experience horrific, ex some women experience horrific working environments. And how would you feel about sitting in a working environment five days a week, eight hours a day, and 12 months a year, and you, you just don't feel motivated, you don't feel happy, or you're just not very comfortable with the environment. Remember, knowledge does not discriminate. It is people that do. And so I'm not saying hire a male, hire a female over a male. All I'm saying is that hire a candidate based on their qualifications and skills, irrespective of whether that person is male or female. And so I'd like to leave you with the following saying. Never limit yourself because of others' limited imagination. Never limit others because of your own limit limited imagination. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Let's try that again. Thank you very much for that great Great talk. I, I thought it was really fantastic. We, we ran a little bit over time, so we don't have as much time for questions as we usually do, do but I, I felt like we could actually let this one continue a little bit longer. Before we start on the questions, two things that are hard in computer science. What are those? <laughs> what is it? All right, I'm hearing more than two. The general agreed upon answer is cache invalidation and naming things. Recently, I saw another suggestion that was the two hard things in computer science are empathy and decency. Um, and I think that's very true as well. So as we start questions, keep that in mind. All right, first question. I saw... You based in Joburg. Yeah. Um, my name is Toby. We're from the Gauteng Python Users Group. I would love to see you on our meetups, please. Awesome. Join on Meetup oh. or on the mailing list. Okay. Hello. Hi. Great, great to talk. This Thank is distorting. Um, I just wanted to know, when from your high school days, uh, how big was your matric class uh, in females, and how many do you think are in a STEM field now? So we had forty per class. So I'm just going to give you an overview of yeah. my class. Um, so in high school, we were 40 in the class, maybe about 30, no, about 25 females. And from that class, um, at school, moving on to university, I was the only one that went into a science, technology, engineering, or mathematics field. Right. Sorry, I'm going to ask her first. Uh, thanks, Rigdwana. That was a really good Thank talk. Uh, I just want to tell that I also come from the science and technology environment, working for the South African Square Kilometer Array, and it was very much the same experience where 
initially was, I was the first female developer there in the team, yeah. but it's actually nice to see that over this last nine years, the team has grown with more females, scientists and engineers coming into the, into the project. So I think very soon you will find that transition going forward. It's just that initial phase that you find getting yourself fit into that environment. But as soon as you find your fit, you find that the rest of the guys around you are helpful and really wanting to help you around. I think so too. Yeah. I mean so I just I had one question, you learning with the new tools and technologies. Yes. And as you move on, how do you find that, um, how do you find that personally? Uh, add into your own, you know, knowledge. Um, do you find that a big difference or, you know, trying to learn new things and then keep that aside and then try on new things? How do you find that transition? Okay. So the learning never stops, ever. But, um, yeah, I think it's just that initial phase, that initial first year that's really difficult because, you know, university doesn't give you that skills that that you need, it gives you the problem solving and the, yeah, the problem solving skills, but it doesn't actually give you physical tools to work with. And so that first year is always difficult. I mean, just to write one program, you need to know so many other things, like I mentioned Git and maybe Vim or Sublime or whatever you're using. And I think it gets easier in terms of now being able to be productive with your standard tools. But in terms of learning new things, it never stops. I mean, right now, I'm maybe learning Ruby, but I'm interested in, for instance, Node, and yeah, it just never stops. Thanks, last question. Um, so the first thing I wanted to say is, is thank you. Um, thank you for having the courage to say that. Um, as, as a guy, <coughs> it's, I'd be lying if I was saying it wasn't a bit awkward to kind of feel it, but it's a completely, good message that I think, as most of the guys here need to hear, so um, well done. Thank you. <laughs> um, the um, second thing is, how can we as um, uh, developers who've sort of been in the industry for a while um, help uh, n newbies when they have to sort of learn this avalanche of, of tools? Do you have any tips that we can sort of change? So that's a really good question. Um, so there's lots of things, there's a lot of meetups. So I'm involved a lot in the Ruby community as well. So for instance, there's things like RailsBridge, which uh, Gabriel hosts, and it's just teaching new developers how to code. And there's things like Black Girls Code, those things are really interesting. And then there's this uh, meetup app where you can create something yourself and just start teaching new developers and basically just intriguing them for them to come through to you. But um, yeah, if you want to speak about that afterwards, I'll give you a list. Cool. Great, thank you very much. Another round of applause. Thank you.